Hello there, this is my clip one on chapter 18 of your textbook on functions of money. Another excellent opportunity to test you. Okay, this corresponds to your textbook. It's a 591 to 592 in chapter 18 of your book. There are three of them. Okay, so the functions, there are only three of them. And um, what are they? There's the medium of exchange, of course, the store of value, and the unit of account. So medium of exchange, store of value, and the unit of account. So if I was a student writing this exam, say, how am I going to remember the three functions of money? Well, I would suggest again a, a mnemonic device, something like Michigan State University. So all you have to remember is MSU, Michigan State University, and that gives you the medium of exchange, store of value, and unit of account. So no problem. Okay, medium of exchange is basically, medium means sort of like the thing in the middle. And it is used in exchanges or in transactions. Basically what this is getting at is that the existence of money um, basically allows an economy to avoid having to do barter. Okay, the, the, there's a whole bunch of reasons as to why barter is, is an inefficient economic solution. Effectively, it boils down to transaction costs or search costs or some, I mean, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, t the, the, the good example of this is, like, I'm teaching you, okay, so I'm your teacher. And let's say I want to, um, you know, buy a steak to have for supper. So I want some, you know, a hunk of cow, <laughs> you know, cooked on a barbecue on my plate. Well, you see, if we had a barter economy, I, the teacher, would, ha would have to find a um, farmer who wants to learn about Management 1P52, right? In other words, there'd have to be this, what they call a double coincidence of wants, right? The, there ha there'd have to be a farmer who has stakes and wants to learn Management 1P52, and of course, there has to be a professor of Management 1P52 who wants to buy stakes and we have to I have what basically has to happen is we have to find each other right well this of course is inefficient it's easier for you know me just to get paid a bunch of money that I can go to a grocery store and buy the steak there so that's why medium exchanges are very helpful it um, you see because if I have to spend all this time trying to look around and search oh where oh where is this this farmer who uh, also simultaneously not only has stakes but also this farmer wants to learn management one p fifty two I'm wasting a lot of time see I, I should be spending most of my time on business you know making powerpoint slides doing what I'm supposed to do for my job if I had to spend all this time on this search looking you know for the farmer I'm wasting my time it's an inefficient use of my human capital if you will so that's why medium exchanges are such a good thing for an economy is that it helps me not waste a lot of time so I can be more productive and produce more PowerPoint slides and more movies for you to watch okay <laughs> I know alright so the second one is store of value store of value basically means is that you you know, if you have a job, most of you have summer jobs, right? So you're working in June, you're working in July, you're working in August, you're making money, you're saving it. Then when your tuition bill comes around in September, right, you want to be able to take your money and pay off the university. Well, if money doesn't serve the, the purpose of store of value, then when you go to pay your bill in September, you got nothing or you can't pay it off. It doesn't buy anything. And that's no good. Right? The whole idea is that if I put money into my bank account, I can leave it there and come back in 60 days and I can still buy stuff. So that's that's the whole point, is that you know, you can make future purchases with money. This again is 
a strong argument for why inflation is bad because again high inflation which is called hyperinflation if it gets really high um, destroys the store of value concept okay in fact if you have hyperinflations what basically happens is that money starts losing these functions it, it no longer becomes a store of value and it also no longer becomes a medium of exchange um, it sort of loses that um, uh, property because no one wants to hold money anymore it's dangerous or if I hold this money maybe in three or four hours I won't buy anything so so no one wants to hold money anymore and people revert back to more like a barter type economy where there's actually some sort of real good it's like a it's like a regression back to sort of a more primitive uh, state of nature if you will because of uh, the hyperinflation right so in other words basically hyperinflation tends to encourage you to go back to a barter economy um, which as I said is inefficient um, so lower inflation rates so you have these sort of central banks you know being very uh, hawkish if you will to keep inflation down would tend to encourage people to want to hold money and the last one is unit of account and basically this is sort of the um, the thing here is basically money serves like the common denominator in, in an economy right so you say I want to go buy a Big Mac it's like six bucks six dollars right uh, or if I want to buy your textbooks hundred fourteen dollars and ninety five cents and you can compare these things across uh, different purchase decisions or you can say, should I buy the GM car or should I buy the Ford car? And so you might say, well, the Ford car is let's say forty thousand dollars, and the GM one is twenty thousand dollars. So you can see, well, oh, geez, the, the Ford one is a lot more expensive. I mean, right? That, that's common sense. The pro, the reason why this is helpful, is you ask yourself, suppose not. Suppose we didn't have this dollar system what would probably end up happening is you would have to learn the prices of goods in terms of all other goods and this becomes an information sort of overload problem what I mean is you'd have to say well it, you know let's say four apples cost one orange and one orange cost three bananas and seven banana, you know, bananas buy two textbooks and you would have to know all these sort of the price of one commodity in terms of all the other commodities and this of course um, as can be shown mathematically be can become a very large number very very fast um, so the uh, whole unit of account thing by having everything denominated in dollars makes it so much easier to compare for comparison shopping purposes right and also for business purposes too like if you're let's say an investor you're saying should I invest my money into you know um, General Motors or Ford I mean the, the, the correct answer is don't invest in either of them but <laughs> auto, the automobile industry is not, not the best place to be in right now but let's say you know maybe I'll use a different example um, let's say the Royal Bank versus one of these American banks and then you'd probably want to pick the Canadian banks because they're usually more stable it's a better example but how would you come to that conclusion? Well, normally what an investor would do is they'd pull out a bunch of accounting statements and they'd look at the cash flows and the profitability. And so it's easier to compare, you know, um, let's say the Royal Bank statements expressed in US dollars to an American bank expressed in US dollars. And then you can compare like which one is producing more um, solid profits, steadier cash flows and stuff like this so that's that's sort of also another reason why it's helpful to have a common denominator or right? in this case it would be US dollars across the board okay so that concludes my movie clip on functions of money